Hey friends, it's Ryan Brown. I'm here in the new studio in our office in Palm Beach Gardens, and we are live and we are local. We're going to be talking all things local with a good friend of mine today. Uh, we're going to talk about real estate strategies, investing, some sell strategies, and discussing some local news. And uh, super excited to have my good friend here, Brian Wilder, big producer, ha operates on a team with his mother, his wife, and his brothers, did about 117 deals last year, $50 million. And uh, thanks for coming, Brian. Yeah, man. I, I was actually excited to come see your new place. Um, I remember the backstory. You gave me a call probably a day or two after the fire here, and I hadn't been here since then. And geez, this place is beautiful. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Your studio is awesome. I actually walked in the studio and said, I was just telling Chris, who owns our brokerage now, we needed something like this. And he gave us about ten a tenth of what this looks like. So this is super awesome. Very excited to be here. Thanks. Yeah, no, this is great. I'm, I'm super uh, happy we're able to build this studio out just to provide value to the local market, to our agents, and uh, hopefully have some really good content, which we're going to share today. So before we get into all that, tell me a little bit about your real estate career. How'd you get into real estate and a little bit of the backstory and how the, the whole family kind of came together? Gotcha, gotcha, for sure. Uh, so I was the cliche. I was a bartender before I got into real estate. Um, the backstory is my my family was investing in the 80s when I was growing up. Uh, so I always had kind of real estate in my blood in that regard. My aunt was a real estate agent forever. I think she's probably 50 years in. I don't want to age her, but she's probably 50 years in to being a realtor. And uh, I've got a picture of myself with that old gold jacket from Century 21 back in the day when oh, I was yeah. like eight. So uh, real estate was kind of in my blood. I think I was in my early 20s and I was looking to find a career. I had just had my first son and bartending and kids don't really get along all that well because the, the time just don't work out. Yeah. Uh, so hopped into real estate. Um, first year I was in real estate, I think it was rookie of the year. My mother who ended up becoming part of the team and bought the office that I was at was my first investor. And we were buying properties and flipping them over on the east side of town, which is where I lived at the time. Uh, so we were buying the old Spanish mission style houses and we were fixing those things up and uh, reselling them. So that's kind of how I got started. Geez, that was in early, late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, so I saw, I ran all the way up to the 2004, 5, 6 run. And then tell me about the, the team. Gotcha. So we've probably been a team for eight years now. Uh, my mother was first on board. My older, uh, my younger brother, Blake, was next. I believe my wife and uh, Jonas came on board right after that. Um, and we kind of merged everything over to the Wellington office, uh, which is the last office my mother owned before she ended up uh, selling out and acting like she's retired, but she's really not. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, um, we've got an admin that works with us, but it's definitely family centric, family oriented. Um, we're talking or hanging out all the time. And, and what I can, what I can attest to is like, you know, all the clients that we worked on together, or we have worked on together either with you or Diane or Blake, like the, all the clients just love you guys because you treat, treat such good care of them. And, um, and, you know, especially with like Diane, I love your mother. Like she is such a special person. And I just love how like every single client that she refers over that we work on together, like you, you literally think they're like family. Like how, that's how they act. But that's kind of how it is. Yeah, yeah, for sure. We treat our clients like family. Yep. Yeah, so I, I really love working with you guys. So tell me a little bit about um, like how you're involved in the community and um, you know some of the things and how you generate business and um, get yourself out there in the local market. Gotcha, gotcha. So I've got five boys, which keeps me very active. Um, they've all played sports, whether it be baseball or football or basketball. So I'm out in the community already, uh, primarily with baseball because all of them really dove into baseball headlong. A uh, little baseball park that we've been out of for the last 21 years is Okahili Baseball Park. And I think I'm going to probably get a field named after me sooner or later because I've been out there so long. But uh, it's the give back is really more. It's for me more than it's it, it's for the kids. The kids think it's for them. But I mean, I get so much out of giving back to that community. Yep. I actually was just uh, speaking with the uh, the head board member there, and I was working on something that's going to be pretty unique. I haven't even talked about it yet, but I'm going to try to make it so we sponsor out everything out of the park 
So the actual baseball piece of the puzzle there is going to be free. So that's going to be coming up in the next couple of months. So I'm going to be looking for some sponsorship there out in the community. But I think it's doable with the way Palm Beach County has grown. And there's so much corporate out there now that I think uh, we can definitely get that done because I think we're missing the boat a little bit because baseball can be expensive. I mean, you've got kids like I've got kids and there's a lot of things you can spend your money on. And uh, if we can get people into the baseball world for nothing other than their time, I think that's a big deal. So you have one of your kids that, that plays college ball? Yep. Just got off the phone with him earlier today. He went three for three last night with two walks. He had a great night. Uh, and he talked to his grandpa, and his grandpa was super excited because he normally doesn't call him, but he was talking to him for an hour on the phone, and he got all those hits and walks. So he had a really great game. So grandpa thinks that he should have to call him every day so he can get his hits yeah, on. It's a good luck term. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. And all your kids played ball? All of them played ball at some point. Um, I've got the last one now, Gavin, who's 10, who I coach. We're actually in the middle of uh, the Cal Ripken districts, which are up in Jupiter this week. And uh, we ran up there last night, and I was running up the turnpike, and there was not a cloud in the sky. And somehow, by the time we got to Jupiter, and I'm opening my car door, the horn's going off, and uh, they banged it out for the night. And it seemed like the storm came from nowhere, and all the way back home, it was raining while I was driving up. There was nothing, but that is South Florida weather for you. That's it. Yeah, so it's it's you know it's a good testament to like a lot of like a lot of agents just to show listen get involved in the community like you're you're kind of killing two birds with one stone is like you're spending time with your kids you're pouring into them but you're also involved in that community which you get a lot of business from just naturally. I literally last week just closed on a lot for a client that came out of Okahili, and it's one of those things where you don't even. Th- think about it I don't even have to think about it it just literally like you said it naturally happens where you get to know somebody they know what you do for for business Um, we know what they do for business and as a real estate agent I'm a really a natural referrer anyway Um, so if I can help my baseball families out with business and they can help me out with business I think it's a it's a win-win for everybody yeah I love you do that like if you look at your social media like you know you're always posting like hey this is a great plumber and you'll send a picture of the card out or, hey, this is a great electrician. And you're always, like, promoting other people and trying to build that network. And I, I see that. That's that's a great thing. I don't see a lot of people doing that. And, and you do it. You execute on it. Yep. Let's talk a little bit about, you know, when it comes to selling a property in this market. So we're talking South Florida. We're talk- I mean, some of your areas are, like, West Palm, Wellington, Royal Palm Beach, Lots Lots Hatchie, Hatchie, yep. um, Acreage. Mm-hmm. Like, when you're selling a property in the market, you know, how do you sell a house quickly? Like, what are the houses that are selling fast in this market? Because some are sitting on the market, and some are, like, 10 offers overnight. Yep. Um, it really depends on several factors. Um, pricing it right is so key. And what it's one of those things where you say it so often, it almost comes off as a cliche, but it's so true. In this market, with all of the pressures that are on buyers, whether it be rates or insurance cost or all of the other things that are going up if you're out of the market just a little bit on price it can really really affect you and it's crazy how little that money can be it can be a couple of thousand dollars it's crazy how little that can be i've price adjusted properties five ten fifteen thousand dollars and when you're talking about a five hundred seven hundred eight hundred thousand dollar house that's really not a lot of money right but it's crazy how that little bit of adjustment makes the difference and you'll go from not having an offer on a property to having one two or three offers on on the property typically all things being equal i try to coach my clients into pricing their property just a little below market and having the market drive it up Mm -hmm. and you get better terms that way um you don't really see it as much in this market as you did a year or two ago where you're getting extra time in the house or things like that but i do see a buyer's overlooking things on an inspection report if they think that they're getting a value on the property. Whereas if you're starting high and they chisel you down, they're going to chisel you down on price, but they're also probably going to chisel you down on inspections and other things like that as well. So if you listen to the news, you're going to hear, oh, the market's soft, rates are high, is the real estate market going to crash, like all this type of stuff, right? But I've had like four clients in the past week that are in bidding wars with like multiple offer situations. So, like, what's going on? What is that all about? So, great question, great question. And I think you've got to look at it this way, is that most of the news is talking nationally, and what's going on nationally isn't anything 
like what's going on locally. We're still a, a big driver because of the things that Florida has. We have sunshine all the time. We don't scrape ice ever unless it's on like a margarita or something like that, right? That's just not anything that you've got to worry about. Um, schools are great. Obviously, the weather's great. The taxes are really, really good. And we have a lot of different places coming in. I mean, the up north clientele that have always come are coming in droves still. They're bringing their families with them. But something that I haven't ever seen in my career, and it's 25 years long, is the Californians that are coming. I mean, we get people from coming from places that they didn't come from before yep. uh, that you're seeing a lot more different license plates than you used to see. It's funny. We went to, uh, I took the family to Seasons 52 like a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. And we were walking up, the one in Palm Beach Gardens has a, like a really big hill and all the cars are parked on the side. And as we were walking up, I was talking to my daughter who's eight. I'm like, I was like, look at the, because I started noticing all the license plates yeah. in every single one. It was like Iowa, Wisconsin, Texas, New York. And so we're trying to see how many different license plates we could find. And it was incredible. A lot of people here moving from out of town. So the client says to you, hey, Brian, you know what? I'm going to wait until prices come down. What would you say to that? So... My typical uh, coaching up there would be, do you remember when there were crazy bidding wars and you were having to go 50, 60, 70, 80, dollars over asking? You had to let the seller stay in the house for an extra 30, 60, 90 days. You had to waive appraisals. You had to waive everything. Well, that's where we're not exactly at. I mean, you do see some properties that have multiple offers on it and there is a little bit of a bidding war, but I remember having, I can remember an open house that I did. It was down in Broward and I got there 15 or 20 minutes before the open house and we're driving in the neighborhood and there's a lot of traffic in the neighborhood. I'm like, what's going on with this, this neighborhood? What's going on here? And I pulled up to the house and there were 25 to 30 people waiting in line outside of the house. And by the time we got done, I think we had over 100 groups through that house. It went multiple offer. It went way over asking. It went, they can stay as long as they need to stay. Um, that's not what you're going to have to deal with now. So what you can get now is you can get a nice property. You can get way better terms than you could before with regards to price, inspections. I mean, I see people working on that. Uh, roofs are a big deal right now. Yep. If you have a roof that's over a certain age, um, it's going to need to be replaced soon. I have credits coming back for that kind of thing. Closing cost credits are things that you could never get yep. when the market was smoking hot. And now you can get some closing cost credits too. Um, so I think, I think the sellers overall are, are coming to the conclusion that they've got to work with you. Whereas before they weren't willing to work with you at all. Yeah. That's the thing is that like what we're telling clients is listen, Date the rate, marry the house, divorce the rent. For I mean, sure. Let's keep it super sure. simple. Like we can always refinance the rate. So don't get stuck on the rate. If the payment's a little bit higher right now, as long as it fits within your overall financial plan, go with it. Get the house that you like. We can always refinance the rate when they come down. Mm -hmm. But listen, I mean, once rates drop, let's just say rates drop to four and a half percent. What do you think is going to happen? All these people on the sidelines, they're going to now... Coming out of the woodwork again. Going to get out of the woodwork. And then you have also all these people that were sitting on these low mortgages. They're going to want to list their house and buy something. So they're going to be on the market buying as well. So, you know, don't wait for that to happen because it's going to be a rewind of two years ago. You definitely have way more options right now in the market than you have had probably in the last 24 to 48 months. Right. Yeah. I've never seen a market... Well... It feels like we're back in like a normal market, like pre-COVID, where, you know, you can actually negotiate a seller concession. Yeah. We can get the seller to cover some closing costs. You can negotiate inspection items. Like, it's nice. It's a normal, kind of more of a normal market. I honestly almost couldn't work with buyers for a little while because it was just so hard. You had to sling so many offers. I mean, yeah. to get anything under contract in your conscience would get to you because you know they were they were overpaying and they were giving terms that you wouldn't typically want somebody to give, but that's the way the market was and we had to make that adjustment. I feel I can sleep much better at night knowing that I can negotiate a little bit uh, for my buyer client now and we're back into buyers and honestly, I love the hunt. So I love working with buyers as much as I like working with my sellers. So kind of to rewind, like, do you feel that properties will go down? Because you still have so many of these people are there saying, listen, I'm going to wait till properties go down. Like property values are going to go down. Like I have seen markets here and there have a little bit of flexibility, but I can remember they were basically talking about, you know, 2007 and 2008. And I'm like, 
I don't see that ever happening again. There's just not enough houses. Um, that's actually one of the things that we'll probably talk about a little bit later. But the driver for the Western communities is really the new construction that's going out on out there, uh, the Avenir, the Arden, and the uh, Westlake. And all of the cities that have those neighborhoods in them, all of their numbers are still cranking. I literally just got a call uh, right before we went on today from a client that wants to go out and see a Westlake new construction house. Uh, they're just building many towns in yep. in these areas. So I don't see it in South Florida. I just don't. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree 100 percent. What are some areas where, um, you know, sellers are making mistakes when they list houses? Um, some of the things that you could get away with before were, was deferred maintenance uh, that in the hot market, you could just whitewash that over and say, I just don't want to fix that. Um, I see sellers coming to market with things that should be handled beforehand. Um, one of the things that I just actually had to work through on two of my properties was smoke smell. I had two clients that didn't said they didn't smoke in the house, but they smoked outside of the house and then it brought it in on their clothes and then they sat down on their furniture. And if you're a non-smoker, you can smell smoke, a, even a little bit of smoke. Oh, yeah. Uh, so those are things that, um, we actually ended up having a company come in and do an ozone treatment, uh, with a deionizer. Uh, to get the the smell handled. Uh, so that's something that I see. Overpricing properties is something else that I see. Why don't we just try it on? And what I typically tell them is there's there's a first impression and then there's everything after the first impression. Yep. Um, if you're going to try something on, you want to do it really, really, really short term, seven to 10 days for a try on price, see what the market will bear. And if you're not getting action, you need to make a reaction move really, really quickly. Uh, Otherwise, I mean, if the house is going to be on the market 60, 90 days, people are going to wonder what's wrong with that house. That's typically what happens. Why is this house back on the market? And you have to explain it. Yep. Now, one of the big issues right now that we could all agree to is like the roofs are a problem. And with the new legislation, <sighs> citizens, which probably find it, which probably ensures like 90% of all new yep. insurance policies now came out and said as of May that the roof has to have at least five years left of expectancy mm -hmm. on it. So if you have a seller that has an older roof, maybe a 25-year-old shingle roof where maybe there's not five years left on it, how are you handling that situation when the seller doesn't have the money maybe to pay for it? Uh, there's a couple of different routes we can go. I actually literally have a seller right now. We were on the market. He had a roof coming, but it was a tile roof. And it's back backordered. Like everything else seems to be uh, a shipping delayed problem. And he has been literally waiting since November. We had it on the market. We had multiple offers on it, but there was a lien in place for the roof. So you couldn't close until that roof got yep. done anyway. Uh, so we ended up actually taking the, the house off the market for, I think, 45 days. And it's about to go on in a week or so. But that's definitely conversations you need to have up front because it, Insurability obviously is important because if you don't insure it, you can't finance it. Yeah. And there are definitely houses out there that you literally, the first question you ask walking in, if the agent hadn't already put it on the MLS is, how old is the roof? Is it going to be a problem or is it not going to be a problem? Yeah. You definitely want to have somebody come out ahead of time and check the roof out. If it, it's a question at all, have an inspector go out and get that five-year uh, cert before you even list the house. Yeah. yeah, I agree. We just had a client too that bought up in... Um like Port St. Lucie and the, it had a flat roof and it, it was done. You know, it was pretty much done. The seller didn't have any money to fix it. We couldn't get insurance like through regular channels. Citizens wouldn't insure it. Nobody would insure it. So what we ended up doing is getting the client a builder's risk policy, which yep. like strips out all your personal contents and mm -hmm. pretty much everything else. And so we got a builder's risk policy, use that to close the deal. Cause our company will allow us to use that to close. So we use that to close. He put the roof on right away. And then just got a new policy like 30 days after closing. So that's another like little strategy where, you know, you can use it. And then he got the, he got a great deal on the property because obviously he needed a new roof. He had to pay for it cash. Yep. So it's not always like that because some, some borrowers or buyers out there, they don't, they don't have the money to put the roof on either. Uh, yeah, no, that's definitely an issue. And, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a South Florida hurdle. Yep. Uh, we know it's a hurdle and you want to mitigate that as much as possible. So you get in and check those kind of items off the list as soon as you can possibly check that item off the list. And from an agent to agent standpoint, if I'm dealing with another agent, they know the problem. They yep. know what we're going to have to go through. So it's definitely um, much more of a working together as opposed to um, when the market was crazy 
Uh, if you were the selling agent, you really didn't have to do a whole lot of working together because the market was going to take care of itself anyway. Right. It, it was what it was. Yep. So you do work with a lot of investors. I know you and your team uh, do. So what have you been seeing investment wise for investors? Are there certain areas where investors are investing right now? Good like question. Great question. Certain towns or areas or little pockets. Like what's kind of hot right now on the investment side? Um, the market in Wellington super unique. Um, I honestly don't think in Palm Beach County there's a market quite like Wellington because the equestrians that come in, um, there is a four month or a six month rental that you can basically make all of your money on a house in that window. And if it has no HOA, you can potentially Airbnb it the rest of the year. So a lot of properties out in Wellington are getting bought up and the prices are staying high because they're really cash cows. It's not like the regular 12 month rental. It is the equivalent of Airbnb money year round. So like a seasonal rent for equestrian would be what, like January to April? Well, there's different seasons, but you can go as early as October, October, and you can go as late as basically Easter. So yeah. So people are buying in Wellington and renting it out. I mean, there's a lot of buzz around Wellington, which we'll for talk sure. about in a second. Um, what are some mistakes to avoid as a first time home buyer? The single biggest mistake I see first time home buyers make is they don't get pre-qualified before they go looking for houses. So they have a house picture in mind and you go look at it. You have an unseasoned agent that doesn't require them to get pre-qualified up front. Yeah. They go see a dozen houses. They fall in love with this house. And then they go back and get pre-qualified and come to find out that they don't qualify for that house. So you've basically been showing them property that may be fifty, seventy-five, a hundred thousand dollars over budget or more. And you've got to come back and try to explain that, no, they can only afford X. And that X house doesn't look anything like the Y house that they really, really wanted. And that really is a dream crusher for a lot of people. Yeah. You've got to get pre-approved. It's just, there's no way around it. You have to get pre-approved. And you got to make sure that you're, I mean, one of the things that we preach all the time, you got to make sure your lender is actually doing a formal pre-approval and not a pre-qualification. And some people like don't know the difference and they're yes. like, oh, Oh, yeah, my bank pre-qualified me or they pre-approved me. And then I'll ask the client, like, cool, um, did you send them all your documents? No, 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 they just pulled my credit. Well, that's a pre-qualification, not a pre-approval. A pre-approval is when you validate all those documents. Like you validate the income and the tax returns and the assets. And if you're getting a gift, a gift letter, and you're verifying all the credit and getting explanations and going through that whole process. And it's interesting because like the CFPB actually just came out with uh, like a warning letter about two lenders saying lenders that are issuing pre-approvals that are technically pre-qualifications could be now held liable. Oh, wow. Which I think is awesome. That so, is. Yeah. Uh, I've had, when deals go bad, that's why they go bad. You've got a lender that's just shotgunning out uh, pre-approvals that are really only pre-qualifications. And as you get into the process, so you've got the buyer there, 500 to $1,000 in on an inspection. There are another 500 to $800 in on the appraisal to come to find out that they honestly never could have qualified for that property to begin with. Right. And yep. you've got an upset buyer that doesn't understand the why because they're not a lender. They don't understand. They thought the pre-approval was legit and it wasn't. And then you've got the seller on the other end that's like, you really brought me a client here that isn't qualified to buy. It's a disservice to everybody. It, it is. Really is. It yeah. it creates so much brain damage out there. Bad, like they want to come off the market and not look for a while. Kind of, kind of bad because they're yeah. just so disappointed that they didn't get that house. Because by the time that you've got that kind of money invested and time invested, it could be one or two weeks into the process. That's right. You're you're very upset. Your wife's very upset. <laughs> Your <laughs> wife is very upset. All the wives are upset. All the wives are upset it, for it, sure. It's funny we had we had this deal. Um, I just closed last week and so as a past client of mine he called me up and he's like hey listen I want to let you know I'm, I'm you know I'm under contract to buy a house and I'm on my fifth extension I'm like whoa what's like what's going on it's like well I'm sorry I didn't call you earlier but the realtor referred me to his mortgage person and um anyway we're on the fifth extension and, and the other lender doesn't know if they can do the deal I'm like, well, yeah, after five extensions, yeah, probably. Yeah, <laughs> probably the writing's on the wall on that one for sure. Yeah, it's probably not going to happen. 
And so anyway, we end up, I ended up updating his application, getting all the information in and they were trying to do a conventional loan structured a certain way. Well, there's no way like I'm, in two seconds, I knew this was structured all incorrectly. So I removed a borrower, changed some things around, redid it as an FHA deal. I called the listing agent, called the buyer's agent. I'm like, listen, I can close this deal in eight days because we already have other information. I'll try, I'll get my appraiser out there tomorrow. We literally submitted it, closed it in eight days. Get, you know, got the seller all taken care of. Both agents posted like a five-star review. They're just like blown away. I was like, guys, next time don't call me when it's uh, five extensions in. But I've it, never even heard of five extensions. Yeah. I've never heard of five. Yeah, me neither. But like the moral of like the story is like, listen, you got to be fully pre-approved. You got to make sure the lender's validating all those documents. And as a listing agent, one extension, okay. But if you're going in for your second extension, it's probably a good idea to talk to a different lender. Or at least get the second opinion. Oh, 100%. You've saved deals for me on both ends, buyer side and seller side. You get a buyer that's just hard-headed and won't listen to you, and they're going to go with who they're going to go with, and yeah. they're uh, they're deep into the process and find out that they actually couldn't get the loan uh, that they were looking for. Or the, the other thing is, is I see lenders out there that sell rates that cannot happen, and that's how they get them. They tell them one story, and then they get all the way to the closing table, and they find out that it's a wholly different story. And right. that's the one thing that I can say about you is, whatever the rate is up front is going to be the rate at the end and you're truthful throughout the process. And it's a big deal. It's a huge deal because those are referral points for you and me later on down the road. hundred percent. Yeah. We just closed the deal where the guy was, he's like, listen, this online lender's given me a 5.875. <laughs> I'm like, man, I go, and he's like, no points. I'm like, what? I go, that is an awesome deal. Like congratulations on getting a great deal. Do you mind if I just take a look at the LE just to make sure, <laughs> just to give you a second opinion. He sends me the LE. 6.875. He's like, well, the loan officer told me 5.875, but I said, but your your federal loan disclosure says 6.875. So yeah. no, it's not 5.875. So um, there's a lot of little bait and switch tactics that people try to use. But, you know, in the end, you know, um, I think your reputation stands for itself. You know, if you do good business and you shoot it straight to people, you know, you're going to get endless referrals. Uh, when you're in it for the long run, right? Yep. There's a lot of people that got in the market when it was hot on both sides, real estate and mortgage. And you work one way when you're just burning it up like that. But when you're thinking five, 10, 15 years down the road, like we are, it, you can't do the things that those fly by nights do. Yeah. What are you seeing out there for, for we, we talked a little bit about investor properties, but what are some investment property strategies that people are using? Obviously there's many different ways to invest in real estate whether it's just, you know, buying a primary residence or a long-term rental or an Airbnb or seasonal, we talked about equestrian, um, or you're doing maybe a fix and flip or new construction. Like, what do you, like, what are you seeing out there that investors are doing that, that they're getting nice returns on? So first and foremost, the, f the best investment is the first investment. Get in, buy something. You yeah. can always move up. If I had it to do all over again, I would have probably bought a duplex. Um, and then rent it out one side and lived in the other for free. House hack. And then move up from there. Um, but I get a lot of people that they want the dream house when really they just need to work their way up to the dream house. Uh, in Palm Beach County, it's not super inexpensive here anymore. You're going to have to start somewhere. And start somewhere may end up being a condo that moves into a townhouse, that moves into a, a, sing, a smaller single family house that you have to get up to the point where you're up into the, the larger house. Um, but there's still great deals on new construction. And honestly, that's one of the drivers. Um, I, the person that called me earlier today was looking at a specific home. And you can get a fairly large three-bedroom, two-bath, two-car garage, close to 2,000-square-foot home out in Westlake for <laughs> less than, you know, right around 500000 plus probably the lot and some upgrades and things like that. But that's hard to find. I, I mean, the, yeah. the sub-$500,000 house, single family in Palm Beach County is not an easy find anymore. Uh, the only places you can really find that is is some of the new construction uh, that's going on out there. I love your point about the duplex. If you're a first time investor, that is the best house hack. 100%. It's a duplex. You buy one, you buy t two units, two or three units, but and you live in one and you can rent the other two or three. We did this deal. Actually, I did a deal with, with Blake. With yeah, you brother. did. Yeah. This where, is a killer story. You tell this whole story. <laughs> where, where the guy calls up, you know, a younger guy, and he's like, listen, I really want to buy an Airbnb. I want to invest. We're like, listen, why don't you look at multi-unit? He ends up finding a, it was a three-unit, right? Four. Four-unit. It was yeah. a four-unit 
It's like a block away from the intercoastal. Yeah. Needed a little bit of work, but a couple of units were already rented. We were able to do an FHA loan. It was a $900,000 purchase. Yeah, that's the key. That it changes when it's multi-units. Right. Your your ability to buy goes substantially up because you're using some of the income yep. from the extra units. Exactly. Like this this client wouldn't be able to qualify for like a $900,000 loan. But if we use the rent from the other units, he did qualify. So he was able to control a $900,000 asset for three and a half percent down, and we got the closing costs covered. So literally, he was That's like, ridiculous. He was That's like ridiculous. Pocket, maybe like 35, 40 grand. Ridiculous. Like so he moved into one. Yeah. He, I think he rented two long term just to have the stable income that basically covered all of his, his, his mortgage. The other unit he set up as an Airbnb, and he's been renting that Airbnb. So it's like the ultimate house hack. And he'll probably live there for a couple of years. He's going to get married in a couple of years. So yeah. he'll probably live there a couple of years and then move out of the other unit. Now he has four doors. He can go buy a, either another multi-unit. But that's the beautiful thing. With the FHA loan, you can house hack where you can – it's the only loan where you can do 3.5% down on a multi-unit up to four units. Yeah, that, that story was an awesome story. I, Blake and I actually had lunch on that when it, when it was going down, and I'm just like 3.5%. And you're buying a nine hundred thousand dollar property, and honestly, yeah. he can make more money if he wanted to. Just Airbnb them all out. Um, but I understand being a new investor, he wanted to lock in some some income and then kind of work his way up from there. But I mean, that was an awesome deal and a great uh, story for somebody that's just coming into the market that doesn't know what they don't know. But that is a way to make your first million. I mean, honestly, that's the way to make your first million. Yeah. Yep, hundred percent. I mean, if you think of just the appreciation. So historic appreciation is like 4% a year. Mm -hmm. So he's going to be making like 36 grand a year just in appreciation on that property. Not counting amortization of the loan. Not counting his profit from the Airbnb and long-term rentals. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a no-brainer. So, you know, I love... With the write-offs. With the write-offs that come with the investment property. Yeah. That's right. Because he, he's a W-2 employee um, under that certain threshold where he can still you can still show losses against your W-2. Once you, I think you make over 150,000, you, you have to book the losses. You can't show them. Mm -hmm. But overall, yeah, it's just a great, a great investment uh, strategy. A um, couple other things I wanted to chat about was like technology. Like has, how has technology impacted uh, real estate and how is it impacting real estate? So from my perspective, being in the business as long as I've been in the business, I had a great grandmother that she lived to be 102. And some of the stories that we tell about her is that she literally came from no cars, no airplanes to the space shuttle. So yep. real estate's probably in my 25 years been very much that. I can remember getting into the business and there was no internet. <laughs> there was no, I, I mean, it might have been cell phones, but not much cell phones. Um, you were literally going to the office, grabbing the key from the agent, going to show the property, unlocking the door, showing the house, and then driving the key back. Um, the, the MLS system was just literally a paper that came out once a week or so, and you'd go through it, and basically you had to drive around to find your properties. I mean, it went from that to, I can remember when, they came in to tell us about basically the MLS system that was coming and the internet and things like that. And I just couldn't even picture it. And this is 25 years ago. This isn't a long time ago. <laughs> and uh, to the technology that you've got today, um, every house should have professional photography video. Um, you get clients nowadays. And I can remember the first client I sold this way was basically I sold it sight unseen in person. She didn't come from New York until she closed that day. And we, and I don't even think she did the walkthrough. I went to do the walkthrough for her because I couldn't not do the walkthrough for her. Like, I'm going to yeah. just make sure everything's good because you've never seen this house. Funny backstory, that was probably seven or eight years ago. Sold that house again. She's moving up to the Carolinas. Um, she bought it for 410. I think we, we sold it for $800,000 and she put a roof on it and that was it. So it's hard to quantify how much money you can make over time buying the property that you're going to live in anyway. Yep. Uh, rents are crazy. I think we can both agree that Palm Beach County and rents are just astronomically expensive and they're not going down anytime soon. You, you see something new and you may or may not have seen this, but they're starting to build communities out that they don't sell. They just rent single family homes. There's actually going to be a new one um, right off of 441 and Forest Hill that they're going to build 200 plus homes that are all going to be rental only. Wow. 
and the Lotus development that they're building out there. So you just can't not buy. You just have to buy something first. It can be a condo. It can be a townhouse. It can be a single family house, but just getting your foot in the door. Uh, honestly, that's how I got in the house that I'm in now. The first house that I bought, I think our budget was 85,000. We ended up buying it for 107 and I think they gave us some closing costs. I sold it 18 months to two years later for 185,000 bought the house that I'm in now off the court, off the courthouse steps of a friend of mine helped me work through that. And I've literally been in that house for 20 something years later. I think I bought it for $165,000 and I think it's probably worth eight. How do you make that money? Yeah. Any, uh, any other That's way? Right. That's right. Yeah. Like how do you like mo for most people, most like normal people like to save that amount of money? Impossible. It's, it's super hard. Yeah. yeah. Cause you would go on a cruise. Yeah. You would buy that nice car. It's yeah. really hard to lock that in. And the way housing works is you forget about it. You yeah. don't even think about it. You just make your payment because you're going to either make it somebody else's mortgage payment, or you're going to make your own mortgage payment. Yeah. Why not make your own mortgage payment and, and pay it off. And for better or for worse, I just had my 50th birthday and 30 years goes by <laughs> really <laughs> fast. You don't think it's going to go by really fast, but here we are. I've got a 26 year old son. And I'm, yeah. how can that be? Because I remember being 26 like five minutes ago, right? Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, you know, you've got an <laughs> asset that will be paid off soon, sooner rather than later uh, mm -hmm. that, that you couldn't have. It's being a financial advisor. I mean, but you're not, right? You're just buying a house. You're living in it. You're not even thinking about the yeah. equity later on down the road. And 30 years goes by, it's paid off. And you've got an asset that is basically, I think, uh, you probably agree with me. It's your biggest asset. I mean, most people most aren't people, in the market. That's right. Their biggest single asset is their residence. That's right. Yep. Wealth is created through real estate. Yep. 100%. Grant Cardone. Um, some news that just came out I thought was kind of interesting. Yeah. It broke today for us. Yeah. <laughs> like perfect timing. Yeah. Thank you, Forbes. Um, so Forbes just came out. Wellington ranks eighth on the list of, no, it wasn't Forbes. It was Fortune. Fortune it was Fortune. Magazine. Yeah. Fortune Started magazine. with an F, but yeah. yeah. So Wellington ranks eighth on the list of Fortune's 50 best places to live for families. So they took yeah. one city out of each state in the country and they ranked it and Wellington was eighth on the list. So why? Like, why is Wellington one of the best places to live for families? So, so it was the village of Wellington and now it's grown out of its village size, but all of my kids basically live out there. Um, I'm super close to, to Wellington where I live personally. So I'm out in that area all the time and it's super family centric. It has tons of parks. I mean, I think Wellington, their, their claim to fame is their parks, whether it be baseball parks, soccer fields. Um, they've even got dog parks. Uh, the K park piece of the puzzle always pops up because, uh, potentially was going to be a park and uh, it's actually still groves and they're growing things on there. But uh, some of the best parks that you can get in Palm Beach County are in Wellington. Schools, schools are great. Uh, one of the things that I don't know if it took the scale at all, but some of the, what's changed around here is golf carts, right? Lots of people have golf carts. Well, Wellington just in the last year or so made it very, very easy to run around town in a golf cart. Uh, their sidewalks, they switched it up and put little stop signs right next to there. So you can you can literally drive around Wellington with your golf cart. And we see a lot of people taking their kids to and from school. It's a way easier to get in and out with a small golf cart than it is going to be if you're going to be in your car and in the line. And I see people all day long picking up and dropping off in golf carts. So that's uh, super cool. You obviously have the equestrian piece of the puzzle. And yeah. if you're going to be living in Wellington, there's a high percentage of people that... Um, like the equestrian activities. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of shopping, dining, and uh, even more to come. They're actually just building out a new area that uh, you're going to have a lot more dining opportunities. But it's just, uh, I mean, I don't know. It's awesome. It's awesome out there. I love it out there. And it's safe. Very safe. I don't hear of any crime in Wellington. I'm super safe. Mm, not so much. The, the NFL player was building something out there or just got approved the, the plans to, to develop. So something. backstory on him. Uh, my sons played with one of his sons in the football and we got to meet him. Super nice guy. This was probably 10 years ago and he's still in the NFL. Um, so he's going to be building pretty much kind of like an IMG Academy here in Wellington, in the back wow. of Wellington, uh, on part of the baseball fields uh, that are towards the back. But it is going to be state of the art and it's going to be multi-sport faceted. So it can be football, it can be baseball, it can be lacrosse. They're going to have a lot of different things going on there. 
and it's going to just be absolutely gorgeous. And it's awesome that you get NFL players that have left and bring back such cool things to their hometown. Train the younger kids coming up. Yep. How cool is that? I'm excited to see it. Yeah, I, I love Wellington. It's such a great area. So what I like to do is a little rapid fire. Mm -hmm. Some rapid fire questions. Cool. All right, so here we go. Favorite business book? Favorite? Well, the first business book I ever read was Think and Grow Rich. So it's hard to beat that one. I think, honestly, it's Solid probably... Book. Yep. Yeah, and it's probably printed more than any other book. And it was really coming around... Well, it was two things for me because I was really young at the time. It was who you hang out with matters. Yep. And and that's really uh, the big part of that book is who are your kind of advisory people that you work with. And it comes all the way to today. It's what lender do you work with, right? <laughs> um, you could work with, obviously, there's lenders calling all day, every day. But the program that you have, your back-end systems that you have, the person... Uh, the what's the word I'm looking for um you care like they're like family just like me I mean you take care of people you go above and beyond if something has to happen quickly the guy that has five extensions that you can close in seven days I mean those extensions had to probably stretch out 90 plus days the amount of stress caused by those 90 days and you come in with the easy button and you're getting something closed in seven days I mean come on that's huge that's huge yeah. and it's all because you knew what you were doing and there's a whole lot of people out there in any business that really don't know what they're doing, and you're a top one percenter. Yep. If you could have lunch with one person, dead or alive, who would it be? Oh, lunch with one person, dead or alive. Jeez. So, quick backstory on that one. It's <laughs> a side story. So, my wife and I, for my 50th birthday, I got tickets to go to Nashville. For Christmas, I bought my wife this CMA for uh, CMA Fest. So we were just there for five days. We had a blast. We saw all kinds of acts. Um, one of the the uh, museums there that we walked through had Elvis, Elvis information. So because it's honestly so fresh, that would probably be a pretty, pretty that would be a pretty cool conversation. That'd be a pretty cool to be lunch. Able to have a quick lunch with Elvis and uh, pick his brain. Deep dish or thin crust? Jeez, I mean, I like both, but I can remember. Probably, it had to be in the 80s. Deep dish, Pizza Hut. It's hard to beat. There was one, actually, they don't do it anymore, but it was their barbecue pizza, and we used to order that stuff like crazy. And back in the day, there weren't a lot of dining options in Palm Beach County because we were very, very small when I grew up. Not very big at all. So going out to dinner at Pizza Hut was uh, it. So, yeah, deep dish probably. Favorite baseball glove brand? We just had this conversation. I personally like the Wilson brand. I just bought my 10-year-old an awesome custom-made Wilson. Um, but my older son, he was Wilson, and now he's turned to Rawlings. Um, it, I just wear a catcher's mitt now, so it doesn't make any difference to me. But I say Wilson has a lot cooler-looking gloves, and I, a lot of the younger kids, it's all about swag, right? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I think I'll go with Wilson. Favorite sports team? Geez, that's going to be hard. Basically, anything South Florida. I love my Dolphins, and I've been a fan forever. They've been bad forever. <laughs> I mean, it's been brutal being a Dolphins fan uh, for probably a couple of decades. You're just like, can you just get it together? We had Danny forever, and we were spoiled. It's probably a lot like the Patriots were with Tom Brady, right? They just had the crazy run forever, but they really, really had the run. And uh, and then we were not good for a long time. I mean, we went through the... The after Don Schultz, we went through Jimmy Johnson fast. Nick Saban, who is a world class coach, could only make it down here for like five minutes <laughs> and he left. So uh, I love him. We just had a killer heat run. I mean, eighth seed to the finals was awesome. The Panthers, I don't like watching hockey on TV, but I've been to some hockey. That's yeah, great in person. It is because all the action is really behind the puck anyway. So you get to see the fights and all the things that go on there. But I mean, we've had FAU. Mm -hmm. Lately, make a run. Miami uh, made a run. So, I mean, South Florida sports, one of the, I think, post-COVID, I mean, so much stuff is going on down here. I mean, there's so many great sports teams down here. I mean, and the Marlins, the Marlins are actually above 500. It seems like they win the, the World Series or they stink. And mm -hmm. I think we're, we're, we're going in the right direction there. So there's just a World Baseball Classic. I was at that. I mean, 
obviously I'm a huge sports fan and I'm, I'm at a lot of different things, but I mean, that one's hard. Yeah. I would have to say Dolphins because that was it first. Gotcha. But everything else that's come along, I follow it all. Favorite local restaurant? Oof, that's tough. I like to eat. Um, <laughs> I like to eat. I like to eat a lot. Um, my favorite breakfast spot would probably be Mom's Kitchen. It's a little hole in the wall. It's been there forever on Lake Worth Road. I'm probably there twice a week, maybe three times a week. Um, my lunch spot, I like Flanagan's. They've got a great uh, lunch program there that it's like six or seven bucks for lunch. I walk out the door with tip and all for like $12. Whoa. That's hard to beat. Um, dinner spot, one place in Wellington that my wife and I really like a lot is Kalu's. Um, I'm not sure if you've been there, but uh, there isn't anything on their menu that isn't good. Like, you could just close your eyes, touch a spot, they bring it out to you, and it is great food. Nice. Best business advice? <sighs> Jeez, best business advice. Do the hard thing first. And what most people in my business, the hard thing is the phone calls. Yeah. They don't want to make the phone calls. They don't want to make the touches. Um, get that out of the way first thing in the morning. Make your phone calls. Those are the single most important thing you can do as a driver for your business is just reach out to your contacts. And I, I'm on a lot of different forums and I do a, a, some coaching for different people and you see it all over. It's like, who do I call? How do I do it? your phone? Everybody that's in your phone knows you somehow. If you have their name inside your phone, you just start with a and you go to Z and really that's it. You've got to make your phone calls. And the Brian Wilder crystal ball prediction for December 31st of this year, is the market up, down, even? South Florida market? South Florida market, I think we're still driving the same direction. We don't have enough housing. We haven't had enough housing. We honestly haven't had enough housing for quite some time. I mean, if you do it even nationally, there isn't enough housing for people. We still have the people moving up from down south because it's still less expensive here than it is in Broward and Dade, um, specifically in the Acreage West area, which is every house in the Acreage has an acre and a quarter plus. Uh, that's super unique. There aren't a lot of places in South Florida that you can find 10 or 15,000 homes that potentially you could have an acre plus on with no homeowner association, which is a big deal for most of the people that move out there. Um, it's still super hot. It's uh, And I keep watching the national news and there's like a smoking crazy disconnect because it's, it has nothing to do with us. All the things that drive the South Florida market are different than what's driving other markets. We have people coming here from everywhere still every day new people new license plates all the time so you heard it first on here the market's yep. going to be up at the end of the year staying super busy yep. staying super busy getting uh, i mean my phone hasn't i don't think i've slowed down honestly except for right when covid hit maybe for three or four weeks i hit a bunch of honeydews at the house i was told that the market was going to tank and we were going to have to like lock it down and cut your expenses and i did cut some expenses but pretty much after i got done painting the house i have been going 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 my team's been going uh we've been up every single year since then and i expect us to be up this year nice well man this has been a blast you're a wealthy beautiful place thanks for having me i think i'm the first guy right you are the first. i'm the first guy you gotta love it <laughs> so we did i really appreciate you brian yeah, yeah, thank man. you for everything that you do you're awesome and uh, thanks for coming on.